Mid-Autumn Moon Festival 2016. The city is turning, the trees are turning. We are walking and then swimming through a sea of yellow leaves when Louise stops to bite a perfect persimmon. Her front teeth pierce the skin and she is laughing. I remember my mum cutting persimmons in the sun one afternoon, soft orange bits stuck to her palm. We look up the Chinese name for persimmon on my phone, shizi. We taste the word, we cut it open, wondering at how it sounds so like the word for lion, shizi, lion fruit, like a tiny roaring sun, shiny lion fruit. At dusk, we sit outside, cutting mooncakes into quarters with a plastic knife, peering at their insides, candied peanut or purple yam, matcha or red bean. The moon looks like a single scoop of red bean ice cream, but really it's a girl who ate her beloved, then swallowed the sun he gave her as a gift. Oh, there's always so much to be lovesick for when seasons change. Green bird cages and plastic moon goddesses and pink undies hanging up to dry above the street and boys who only text at night. We lick the sugar off our wrists and it's been so long, so long. Um, I'll read now from the longer sequence that's right in the center of the book called Field Notes on a Downpour, which is, to me, I think this kind of central part of the book. Um, and it kind of chronicles my um, attempts, repeated attempts to memorize Chinese characters, basically, at a time when I was very homesick and full of longing. And I think longing, Jenny, you said is the theme for today. So, and I, basically all my poems end up being about longing, so <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> um, field notes on a downpour. E. The first character of my mother's name, one, is made of rain and language. According to my dictionary, together they mean multicolored clouds or cloud tints. There are so many things I'm trying to hold together. I write them down each day to stop them from slipping. Mouthfuls of rain, the blue undersides of clouds, her hydrangeas in the dark. Also in the dictionary under whim. Language, character, script, warm, lips, lines, veins, cracks in glassware or jade. It was the summer of the watermelons. They were everywhere, tumbling out of fruit shops all along the footpath. The ripest ones flit, split open in the gutters. Every day there's another downpour. More than a hundred characters share the same sound. Zong, assemble, put together, always footprint, trace the uneven flight of a bird. In the morning outside your apartment, the wet leaves from last night's rain had already been swept away. The lady at the fruit shop asks me how I can be half Chinese and still look like this. She points to my hair. We come up against a word I don't know. She draws the character in the air with one finger and it hangs there between us. Juan, curl, to have tender feeling for, to abandon, a net for catching birds. Some things make perfect sense, like the fact that wave is made of skin and water, but some things do not. That night there were cracks in the ceiling where the rain fell through and dripped down the back of your t-shirt, then onto my arm. Last week, 200 white tundra swans were found dead beside a lake in Inner Mongolia. Two days ago, I smashed a glass jar of honey on the floor the glass broke, but the honey held its shards together, collapsing softly. Um, this poem 
borrows lines from a gallery description of a painting by Agnes Martin called Far Away Love. Far Away Love is a five foot square overpainted in light blue wavering. Far Away Love is made of layers of white. Subsequent layers peel away revealing luminous air. Far Away Love is where blue escapes under the lines. Far Away Love is a reversal of the traditional notions of work. Far away love is floating across a pale field beneath a particular hue of sky. Far away love is strong, persistently irregular. It has a hand drawn quality, an imperfect line traced over the surface. Far away love is translucent in the desert. Far away love is present in light reflecting segments into which she pressed lengths of shuddering, some fingerprints still visible. Um, okay. Um, this poem is one that I wrote after watching a movie. So the title shares the name of the movie the Great Wall, directed by Zhang Yimou. The Great Wall, 2016. When Matt Damon saved China by driving his spear into the alien's mouth, I was distracted by Lin May's long braided hair and the way she holds herself so still, ready to strike down her enemies with a knife in each fist. But some things are fixed in the white savior narrative, like the exotic love interest who will risk everything as ancient cities crumble around her. And when you ask me what I thought afterwards in the autumn rain, I wanted to say some parts were beautiful, like the pagoda of iridescent glass shattering into pieces of pink and blue light, just as Lin May lets loose her arrow. And also when you whispered something in my ear and I was hit by the shockwave caused by my body and your breath existing in the same moment in the same universe. Months later, you told me you cried during Rogue One, the scene where two men hold each other weeping beneath the palm trees and light beams blasting the leaves apart and their hands shaking moments before a star destroying weapon obliterates their small wrecked portion of universe. I didn't know what to do with all these space opera feelings, only that I had to exit this particular narrative in which our knees are just touching and we are laughing while the city disappears around us. As if we could reach back through hyperspace to touch the silver holograms of our past selves as if we could go back to some other time on some other planet before the first particles of energy let go of themselves, like the thousand paper lanterns released into the sky above the Great Wall, a thousand tiny fires trapped inside. I think I will just read one more, which is my one and only sonnet, which I will sing. Sonnet with particles of gold. The day scientists discovered the origins of gold, the sound of egg noodles crisping up in the wok, the garden carpeted in kofi petals, the way my phone corrects romati summer to rainstorm. The day after my grandmother died was white gold in color. A star explodes and wings are found among the debris along with pieces of a character I never memorized, our only name for her, poor, a woman beneath a wave. 
Drift, she mouths softly in English. What is drift? My mother translates into her language, not one of mine. I try to make myself remember by writing poor over and over on squares of paper covering the walls. So I'm surrounded by the women and the water radicals they hold close. The tips of waves touch me in my sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who's here now. Only if you don't mind, and if that's okay with you, if you can switch on your camera so we can see your faces, that helps a lot. But only if you don't mind, because I know I've attended readings where I'm like, I don't want anyone to see me. So that's fine. Just, just a suggestion. All right. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from my first book and a little bit from my last book and then some new pieces. This is uh, my first book, To Live in Autumn. And speaking of longing, I wrote this after I left Beirut in 2006. And the entire book is dedicated to the city of Beirut. I'll start with a villanelle. Uh, this is titled, 10 Years Later in a Different Bar. The city has changed like cities do. The bar where we'd sing has closed. We have changed like cities do. There is an alley where the young, the new, drink their beer in sun-drenched clothes. The city has changed like cities do. We once drank beers on the street too. The bars too small for the dreams we chose. We have changed like cities do. Graffiti on the walls, red, blazing blue, says the city is more poetry than prose. The city has changed like cities do. Lore and I light up, smoke a few, search for what we've dropped here, shadows. We have changed like cities do. The liquid light reminds me of you, the laughter, the ceiling pipes. Who knows if the city has changed like cities do, if we have changed like cities do. Um, I'm going to read two from Louder Than Hearts. I'm going to begin with a poem to kind of maybe bring my own spirits up a bit because I've been really down since, down is really downplaying it, <laughs> since the uh, August 4 explosion. Uh, may, you know, maybe this poem, I don't know, you'll see. Anyways, this is called You Fixed It. And if the compass broke, you fixed it fastened the pencil to it with a rubber band. And if there was no hot water, you fixed it, learned to sit on that plastic stool in the bathroom and count. And if it was too cold outside, you fixed it. And there was the smell of burnt lemon on the brazier or the click, click, click of the gas heater. And if you were bored, you fixed it learn to cut paper and color the scraps, learn to write on the walls, and if you wrote on the walls, you fixed it. Scrub them with your mom, who yelled at your big brother, who what on earth was he doing just watching? And if the TV blurred, you fixed it, adjusted the antenna to catch those Japanese cartoons translated into Arabic on the Syrian channel. And if you, hadn't, and if you didn't have enough books, you fixed it, read that French Arabic dictionary the size of your torso, stared at the words crepuscule and shafaq. And if you tripped on the missing tile, you fixed it, learned to count your steps in the dark afternoon without electricity. And if there was no electricity, you fixed it, gauged how dark it was by whether or not you could see your thumb. And if you couldn't see your thumb, you fixed it, got the candle from under the sink. And if the sink was leaking, you fixed it, tied the cloth to the pipe. And if the pipe was leaking, you fixed it, pressed your palm against the hole in the wall until mom called the grocer to call the butcher to call the plumber next to him. 
And if there was a hole in your sock, you fixed it, learned to fold it under your big toe. And if your window shattered, you fixed it, taped cardboard to the frame. And if someone died, you fixed it by telling stories about how crusty their lahm of ajin was. And if the lahm of ajin was too crusty, you fixed it by dipping it in the tahini. And if your sorrow hardened, you fixed it by dipping it in seawater. And if your country hardened, if your country hardened, you fixed it by dipping it in song. <sighs> Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna read one more from Louder Than Hearts. I'm going to read the ghazal. I love ghazals. I love writing them. Um, this is a ghazal for a Lebanese singer called Samira Taufi. It references some of her songs. And the word tibr in, in, this, in the song, in the poem, which I guess is a song, uh, means gold. This is ghazal Samira Taufi sings a love poem. I count the stars and place them in my hand my heart. They're odd, they're even. They say, nothing will go as we planned, my heart. Spare me this city made of Tibr. I will desert this castle, go back to that house of poetry and sand, my heart. All day I pretend to collect water for a glimpse of his dark skin. The bridges almost break. They can't withstand my heart. I was a little girl who sang in a tree. Now, before the afternoon and after sunset and between the two, people listen to my chant, my heart. My smile lies and tells the truth. The audience loves my glitter, my kahal, my shoulder pads, the mole on my left cheek, my wink, and my heart. The young artists sing my songs, that's fine, but they should ask first. After all, I've never been afraid of love, never banned my heart. My stage name, Tawfiq, means success but I don't want to sing anymore. I'm sad for Lebanon, Syria, the land, the land, my heart. Right, I'm going to read a few new pieces. I've been working with bilingual poems lately and I call them duets. Uh, there's equally English and Arabic in, the, in these poems. Uh, if you only know English, you should get a poem in English. If you only know Arabic, you should get a poem in Arabic. And if you know both of them, then hopefully you get a third poem that rises between, uh, from the conversation between the two languages. And I chose this one because it's an ode to the Mediterranean Sea in Beirut. And I keep thinking about the fact that um, the reports say that the Mediterranean Sea swallowed one third of the explosion impact. Uh, and so that's why, I'm, that's why I chose this particular duet. This is called Blue Azraq. Nara al bahra wa la narahu illa fil manam. A patch, a glimpse among the antennas, aw min bayn al shurtani ala al astuh. How to brave this blue. La bahra lana huna wa la quwa. Sometimes I forget the sea is this close. Lana hubbun qadimun yuridu an yahfira laka fil ismanti shatian. My love, I want to dig a beach for you out of this cement. لنا مطر محمل تارة بعطش الأرض وتارة بعفن الشارع. O oh, old faith and new. O oh, time of wells and time of satellite dishes. لنا الحر والرقص على ظهور المباني قد نرى بقعة بحر من هناك. Are the fish still edible? 
Our nets are full of plastic and trash. لنا كأس تجري فينا كنبع صغير ننسج فيه سماء وغروبا ونجوما وتراتيلا. My parents threw me in the sea when I was two and I floated. They called me little fish. My parents trusted the sea more. إلهنا الأزرق لم نعد نعبده وما زلنا نحبه. Oh, blue God, we no longer worship, but still love. لما لا نتذكر البحر إلا عندما تموت العصافير على الشرفات. Over breakfast, I had to convince a friend Beirut was still on the Mediterranean. لمن ندون أحلامنا كل صباح? Are you sure? He asked. Is it a deep, bluest blue? ما أجمل الموت بلا ضرائح. Yes, I said. No, I said. ارفعني على كتفيك قبل أن نحرق المدينة. Lift me on your shoulders. Roll in the tires. Light them up. O oh, city, we no longer love, but still worship. لقد أقسمنا أن نقلع عن عبادة هذه المدينة. Right. Um, I'm going to read from my laptop now. I hope I know how to minimize this screen. Yes, I do. Okay, you guys can still see me, right? Yeah. Just not. Okay, cool. So I don't know if these are poems. These are texts. And uh, I've been, these are very, very recent. And they don't have titles, they just have dates. So I'm going to read just three, three dates. This is August 20, 2020. Do I house my mother's fear for houses? Do I house my father's shaking legs? Do I house Beirut, Tripoli? My daughters who once swam inside me? Do I house sea salt, the Arabian Gulf, distance, Bougainvillea, all this Bougainvillea? Do I house altars, my illnesses, our walks in streets we did not know, or perhaps we did, would fly up toward God in pieces? Do I house my God, my God, my sweet, churchless, mosqueless boat God? All the drunken nights in brutally tender bars near the sea, all the years that were never not a wound. Do I house the roses he picked for me from his garden when we were children? His daily walk from the bus with a single rose? my waiting on the school bench, my knowledge, it was his shadow inside the sunlight on the floor, my not knowing which cities will house our bodies and when and how many and for how long. August 24. If the clocks stopped at 6.08, then how old are we? If the ammonium nitrate was moved to warehouse 12 in October 2014, then how long have we been dancing inside the slaughterhouse? I used to think my trouble was with death. I was wrong. I was cruel. September 23. The valley is an upside down mountain and every story is ordinary. Every migration, not the first. All cities are fictional, which is why they live in us. There's an empty synagogue in Beirut. When my daughter's teacher asks the class to imagine a place of worship for all religions, she draws a garden. Leave any temple alone and watch the grass carpet it. My husband calls from Paris. Two days ago, the president said Lebanon was going to hell. 
the president shrugged and said the money was gone. I make two mugs of coffee. I drink them hot and I drink them cold. I leave one in the kitchen and I leave one in the living room. I'm getting better at this leaving. Some of my loves think they've left the past in the past. But what about the buckets tied to their waists? They're coming. Um, the first poem I chose to read today is actually um, similar to Nina's title. So it's also about the magnolia plant because my mom's from Shanghai and the magnolia is her favorite flower. So I thought it would be apt as well to celebrate Nina's wonderful collection. Magnolias. Picture a girl and a dinner table. The girl will wait till she is told that she can sit at the last seat available after the men and the boys, after the elderly. She does not think it wrong, this box step of worries she has learnt since she was old enough to kneel beneath her mother's shadow whenever she lost her cool. When the girl was eight, she wanted to be a boy. A storm of dresses fell from her mother's lips. The sky was the color of whitened knuckles. The girl acquiesced, marooned on her bed, mannequin beauty ready to drown. Hours later, the girl dreams that the dinner table is an ark she has finally abandoned. The girl dreams that the words sprouting like weeds from her mouth are not weeds, but magnolias, her mother's favorite. Um, the second poem is also in many ways about my home city, Hong Kong. And, and like Zena, I just love that line, all cities are fictional and therefore they live in us. Um, and Hong Kong is a city that lives in me, you know, even though I've been away for a decade now. A wild patience has taken me this far. I am writing in the voice of my most hopeful self. Amnesia was my daily bread. Thank God for fan fiction, for it gets better, for poets audacious enough to mention the body. Do you know what camouflage looks like on a day-to-day -day basis? Checking the coast is clear before opening a single tab and multiple decoys on a screen. Surreptitiously reading Shakespeare, the scene where Cesario woos Olivia. Watching my parents' faces for a sign to hold a tidal wave back. A daily prayer for the strength to confess nothing at all times. One day, it becomes a choice to walk out of this life or to begin living mine. I left half of my language behind to escape my impeccable persona. How I wanted to perform a heroic act to gain acceptance into the kingdom of ordinary people. To love a city and to not have it love you back is its own form of torture. When I met a beautiful stranger for the first time, I was deeply afraid of her tenderness. An appointment with a therapist led to a second date. I was given permission, needed permission. She held my hand till I began to comprehend the territory of skin, its frantic heart and silent palms. Most nights, I dream of my mother's face, by turns harsh and tender. In a nightmare, I shouted at her, neither you nor I are the enemy. What do mothers ask their own daughters everywhere in the world? Is there a question? Ask me something. And this last poem from Flesh is the final poem in the book. What my mother, a poet, might say. Be a river, she might say. Be the water that flows over and under and along so you will never hurt from sharp things. Be the eyes that glow, be the body whose scent and sound attract all the colors of the night. Be the rainbow that leaps into that cleansed dome of sky 
after storms erupt from the breasts of millions. Be the tree that praises even when the cacophony of tractors drown out its hymns. Be the roots that seep through stone. Be the echo of your blood, song of your bones. So I thought I'd share a few newer poems today. Um, I haven't written much, to be honest, since Flesh was published, but um, there are a few poems that I've worked on for a while and it'd be nice to um, share some new work, I think. So this next poem is um, in many ways inspired by two different books. So one is a book called uh, Mothers, an essay on love and cruelty by the um, writer and philosopher Jacqueline Rose. And the other is um, Chen Chen, an Asian American poet who wrote uh, a wonderful debut collection that really also explores his relationship with his mother. And so some of the text in this poem is taken from their work. Um, so I'd like to sort of credit both authors with that. The mother finds her own wild lost beginnings deep within the body of her daughter. After Jacqueline Rose, after Chen Chen. She fed me, clothed me, kept me safe, albeit in excess five layers in spite of subtropical winter heat. So much to eat, I needed digestive pills to ward off the stomach's sharp protest. How not to utter the ungrateful thing, that I am irrevocably her object, that the poet who wrote this saved my life. Sometimes, parents and children become the most common strangers. Eventually, a street appears where they can meet again. How I wished that street would appear. I kept trying to make her proud of my acumen for language. These words have not been for nothing. I wrote to find the street where we might meet again. And now there is relief, guilt or blame, but they are nearly always misplaced. You are born into the slipstream of your mother's unconscious. If someone had told her that the last thing a young mother needs is false decency, courage, and cheer. She might not have hurt us both. But what to do with remorse and love that comes unbidden like a generous rain? How to accept her care? Is there a point at which the mother is redeemed, the child forgiven? Can the origin story be retold, transfigured into the version where the garden is always paradise, and no one need ever fall out of grace. Field Notes on a Family. And yes, I bit into the turbo, sautéed in herb oil, and yes, I made the conscious choice to be pescatarian in spite of all those documentaries about farmed salmon. And yes, I craved the smell of burnt meat. And yes, I could not miss the homeless man sitting outside La Petite Maison. And yes, my mother tried to give him some change in a foreign currency and I stopped her. And yes, I called an Uber for us to return home. And yes, home is a nice apartment in East London. And yes, I read an article on Korean dystopian fiction in translation and felt better for it. And yes, I slept that night in a bed with only me in it. And yes, my partner had stayed that week in an Airbnb in order that my parents might visit me in peace. And yes, I am still trying to achieve my way into love. And yes, I cried when my mother told me to take care of her since it has been so long. And yes, the turbo, it was so moist, it was so soft. And yes, fine dining has forever been a social lubricant. And yes, without fireworks on the tongue to distract us into harmony, there would have been all the love we could muster or a desolation none of us could have withstood. I'll end with this poem. Um, thank you so much. Bright Fear, one. During these lengthening days of sunlight and bright fear, 
There is too much language and too little time. I am afraid. I am left to search for desire indoors, my hands steeped always too long in soap, then the wetness and the drying, to allow once more for soiling, another faint gesture at the enmeshed world, to keep it at bay while keeping it in mind, so I never lose sight of its riven beauty. Today I saw trees and witnessed bodies moving beneath their shade. Two. Before the streets emptied, I would long to dwell in quiet spaces, dreaded long trips underground. Too much of the world kept me on beta blockers as a child. Now I seek solace in walls and try not to allow the headlines to dictate my days. Bright fear comes to those blessed to live in a country goaded by nostalgia. I display my staff badge like a shield. Lecturer might ward off a fist in dusk or daylight. I walk into classrooms feeling the inward twist of what has come before. Histories, memories, facts. Three, to consider grief a resting place is to understand how it can suddenly surge through the body like a bout of bright fear, how it can seat us firmly on the sofa and leave us there for hours till our lovers rouse us to eat, to partake in the daily rituals of an ordinary life. Today, I cried again over a bowl of porridge, the runny yolk of an egg cooling to a crust. All grief at its heart is ordinary. The salt on my mother's lips as she cries about wanting me home. The way a tear comes on, like a poem. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mary Jean. Um, thanks so much for your wonderful poems it's, and also especially for sharing with us your latest work as well. Um, they're just all so deeply moved. So I just wanted to ask both of you, um, at the moment, how are you finding um, creativity in writing and if is it helping you? Is it not helping? Are you um, finding, you know, maybe every day is different and um, maybe at the moment you're not able to write? I'm just curious. Zina, do you want to go first? Yeah, you can go first. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, we're too polite. Um, thanks, <laughs> Nina. Um, yeah, I think it's been hard, actually. You know, I think there was that almost cliche that, you know, lockdown's a perfect time for writers to, I don't know, finish their second book or something. But I, I found that pressure to be quite difficult at the beginning because I did sort of think, well, I should get down to work now. And then I realized I, I couldn't really just, just do that because there's so much happening in, in Hong Kong, here, um, in Beirut, everywhere in the world, you know, it just felt like a time of global sort of conflict and problems really. Um, but I think I, I gained a lot of solace from just reading. So at one point I just told myself, I can't write, that's fine. Just put your work aside. And I just started reading novels and, you know, watching films and just dipping into art that maybe um, my partner has also taken up watercolors. And so I really enjoy just watching her make art, visual art. Um, and that was really comforting. And actually some poems came out of that, just kind of letting myself um, do other things that were maybe artistic, but not related specifically to poetry. I wonder what Zina felt during this time. Um, it's been it's been a very strange time for me since October 2019, so pre-pandemic. Uh, some of you might know that on the 17th of October uh, 2019, uh, revolution started in Lebanon. Some call it revolution, some don't. I personally call it a revolution. And from that day onwards, I was in a state of mind where all I could really do was just consume the news about Lebanon on social media and just watch and watch and watch. And from then until now, I really had 
such a rift from poetry. I couldn't read poems and I couldn't write poems. I was able to read essays, some books. I, I probably had the terrible, terrible idea of reading a 500 page his, a book of history about Lebanon, which depressed me even more. And so what happened is that we've, we, and I mean we, the Lebanese inside and outside of Lebanon, we experienced a period of like being so high the revolution started as such a high note, you know, people on the street, people were singing, were dancing, were protesting. And, you know, you know, some of us dared hope for, for once, right? But then I think uh, starting the end of November, it started going downhill because the, an, an economic crisis really was one of the factors that caused the revolution. And so that economic crisis was getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, our lira, which is pegged to the dollar, was devalued by 80%. Uh, we lost our money in the bank. Uh, it no longer has any value and so on and so forth. And so that by April, which was when we were really into lockdown, uh, I was more worried about what was now being called the hunger revolution in Lebanon than the actual lockdown, if that makes sense. I mean, I was still, of course, worried about this. What the fuck is this virus, right? But uh, my mind was there. And you see the bits that I read today. Uh, this is what I've been capable of writing. Um, I don't know where that's going. Uh, and that started since October 17th and it's on and off, on and off, on and off. Uh, and some of them are really like essays, like very rational essays that has nothing to do with poetry. And some of them are more poetic. That's how it's, I've just been following this, whatever my mind's telling me, if it tells me anything. Um, but yeah, I think when the lockdown started, I was a bit relieved because then I thought, okay, well then, everyone has nowhere to go. So I can just stay home and be glued to that TV, right? But then of course I miss people, I miss touching surfaces, I miss hugging people, I miss dancing with my friends, I miss reading poetry, you know, face to face to, with people. And so I don't know, I've rambled on, I've given a mini lecture about Lebanon instead of really answering your question. I'm sorry, but it's been such a weird time for me. There were so many things happening at the same time that honestly, for some time, the last thing on my mind was writing and poetry. Although, although I was doing writing because I, I, I do believe in, in its necessity. Uh, but yeah, it was all so sudden and so intense. Nina, how about you? I was curious about yourself. Like, how did you find lockdown and writing? Um, yeah, it's been so strange. It's really... Um, it's like coming in waves of um, my reactions to the situation obviously has been changing. At the beginning, I think I felt there was a period, I think, depending on, on where in the world we are, there's like a kind of couple of weeks of kind of shock and, and grief, like anticipatory grief of, of things that we might lose, people we might lose or, you know, all these fears. And so that was just really hard to process, I think. I also was just like, I couldn't really, I'm kind of the opposite of you, Zena. I was like, um, I could only read really short things. Like I had my intention span had gone and I could read like short poems or like, I don't know, bits, bits of like fragmentary essays maybe. Um, and then like you, Mary Jean, I kind of turned my attention more to reading and put pressure off myself. Although I did have some kind of deadlines, which is a strange period to have these deadlines, things that I had to be writing, but felt very like unnatural and, and yeah, but um, I turned to more like visual things and I've been playing with like drawing and sewing and printmaking, which has been really fun to like take myself a little bit out of myself and it's very calming. Um, and now, uh, I don't know. I, it comes in bursts occasionally. I've written a few poems, but um, mostly I think reading has been the thing that has really saved me and and also letting myself do other visual creative things and letting myself think of those things as part of my wider creative practice and not um, like being stressed about like um, the things that are things that I'm doing for money, for commissions, things that I'm not because I don't know, 
like we're in a like time of crisis and so <laughs> i don't know maybe most important is just um keeping our engagement with art in some way and engaging with each other i think is there a question um in the chat jenny i don't know if Oh, uh, Jenny, I think you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Choice of the topic longing, because I think for me, Fleshes is a book of longing. It was like longing to be accepted, you know, longing for home, uh, longing for, you know, peace within oneself, you know, with one's identities. Um, so I think, you know, I have that line where I am writing in the voice of my most hopeful self. I think kind of, yeah, to be able to long for something you, you kind of have to sort of deep down believe that one day it might happen, you know, it might, it might come true. So with, with queer acceptance, for example, like I, yeah, deep down hope that one day, you know, reconciliation might be possible and that, um, you know, my partner might become part of the family and all these things that six years ago seemed completely unfathomable, but now has become a reality. Um, and I think that there's this almost, I think, you know, these poems are, are kernels of hope that you just bury in the ground and you hope one day they'll become, you know, something that will grow and flourish. So that, that was what, um, how I saw longing and hope in my work. Um, how about um, Ina? Um, I think um, Mary Jean summed it up beautifully and I love, thank you, Lisa, I love, the idea of tying longing to hope in that way, which I hadn't, I think myself put to words before, but I think it's definitely true because a lot of my longing, um, like flesh, I think Magnolia is also a book of longing and it's often particular longing for home or homes. And so I would hope that, that yeah, hope, uh, it's a little, odd to think of hope as a thing that I could kind of feel right now but <laughs> but yeah I really love that and because I'm often writing about I don't know my my parents garden which I miss or the sea which I miss um and you know I think it's tied to hope and love I mean I think uh you you t you both of you tied it in really well but what i would add is the element of i guess difficulty uh because often we think of hope as this kind of floaty i i don't know like as this positive thing right hope for me hope is very difficult uh uh, not that it doesn't exist, but if it, it has to exist, then it's very difficult. And, and, and maybe, maybe they're interwoven in that difficulty, the difficulty of being away from your home and being away from your language, the, the difficulty of returning, uh, but also the difficulty of, of hope in itself. It's, it's very difficult to be hopeful at the moment. Uh, and yet, I don't think we... Uh, I think, or my mind operates. And I think for me, there has always been uh, a variety. I grew up around a variety of languages. So yes, Arabic is my mother language, but then I went to the a French school. Uh, so there was always French and Arabic. And then when I was 12, we started learning English as well. And then I went and did a BA and, MA, and an MA in English literature. So the, I, I always was at the intersection of three languages. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm most comfortable in between those languages. Do you know, like I'm, I'm not perfect in Arabic. I'm not perfect in English. I remember the first year, uh, when I was a first year university student, uh, like I, I had a very high average, but I once raised my hand in class and said, what does plot mean? Because I knew it in French. Now I no longer know it in French because I knew it in French and I didn't know what plot means. And the teacher, I remember the teacher was like, really? So um, I've always existed 
you know, at this, these kind of weird intersections between languages. And I think my poetry simply reflects that because that's how I, my mind operates, if, if that makes sense. Um, maybe Nina, you should definitely talk about, like, I'm so interested in your Chinese characters, so I'm just chipping in to say, love to hear more. Sure. Thanks, Mary Jean. Um, yes, I think longing and language is really, they're tied together in my writing because um, I love what you said, Zainab, writing in the space in between. I think I do that too but it is with a kind of, um, a kind of, yeah, longing and, and hopefulness actually, because I'm really not fluent in the languages that my um, mother and, and grandfather and grandmother all speak. And so, and yet those languages are a part of me. Um, and so they're inside me. So when I hear them, they're very familiar and I can kind of, um, sometimes there's like a emotional or is it maybe a physical comprehension, comprehension that occurs um, that is not to do with understanding a, the kind of actual words that are being said. Um, and so I think that's often what I'm trying to get at in my, in my poems. And then, and yeah, because most of this book was written at a time when I was a language student and um, which was a few years ago now. So that was kind of the height of my fluency, which was kind of near fluent. And now it's gone, it's, you know, disappeared again, because that's what happens. But um, at that time, I was like desperately trying to memorize as much as I can, because with writing Chinese characters, it's about memorization and muscle memory. Um, so I was really interested in that idea of the characters becoming embedded in in like in my body and how I could try to keep them there and not forget them of course I've forgotten most of them now um but but in some in other ways they are still there so yeah I think language in the body is um something I'll always be writing about Um, I guess I, I can sort of jump in quickly. I mean, Jacqueline Rose, um, I, I have always been interested in, in psychoanalysis and just reading about mothers. I suppose that's just because of my fascination with, with mothers uh, in general. But um, yeah, I think, I think specific to that poem, um, I, I found that I needed, I don't know, there was a gap. Like I was trying to say certain things about reconciliation and, and the aftermath of, you know, um, many years of trying to, yeah, make peace with, with who I am. And and then I kind of stumbled up across this book and, and maybe it was something to do with what we were saying earlier that, you know, when, when I couldn't write, sometimes, you know, the essay, somehow it's, it's persuasive voice. It's kind of, I just needed something like that. So when I read um, Jacqueline Rose's book on mothers and, and it's a very empathetic book towards mothers, I think people might think, oh, it's essay on love and cruelty. It actually is, is the cruelty that the world mets out towards mothers that the standards of being a mother is so high and so impossible that it's like, you know, it causes a psychic wound for mothers because they can't be perfect, but the world expects them to be perfect. And then what happens to their children? Because they obviously have to, you know, release some of that, that, that pressure somewhere. So um, I found it a very empathetic view towards mothers and, and, you know, their flaws perhaps. And so some of the words from Jacqueline Rose just seeped into my poem. I, I felt that it helped me say certain things. And then that line of, you know, um, you know, sometimes parents and children become the most common of strangers, um, but then a street appears where they might meet again. That is a line from Chen Chen's poem. And I've always just loved that, you know, I just, and then I just thought, yes, that's exactly what I've been trying to do is to kind of, you know, build towards that, that meeting, that, that sort of reunion, if you will. Um, and so, yeah, just specifically, my mother is a writer as well. She writes in Chinese, but she doesn't speak or write in English. And so, um, in the initial process of coming out, I, I found English to be like a queer haven of sorts because I could, you know, read Shakespeare and just be the dutiful student who's learning English and learning literature, but actually be reading about stuff like cross-dressing, right, in, in Twelfth Night, for example. Um, and it felt quite, you know, uh, radical and it felt, felt, felt like a, yeah, like a, a place where I could, I could fashion a new self that was different to the self that I had grown up with. But I think increasingly, I almost think that that answer is a bit too simplistic because, um, 
you know, English also poses its issues. Like I, I realize increasingly that there are ways of thinking about the self and and other and society that you know maybe English is more attuned to, but also the idea of being a collective, you know, the idea of, of um, care for others, I think, especially in the wake of the pandemic, like I'm realizing there are, there are ways of being and thinking in my mother tongue that are also really radical and really important. And that, that the way I kind of split off the two languages growing up was just a kind of defense mechanism. So actually, you know, I found freedom there in English initially, but increasingly I, I want to kind of push myself to question those assumptions a bit further and to actually think maybe in Chinese, there's also a lot of freedom to be found. I just need to look for it. So yeah, thanks for that, Hannah. And nice to see you again. Do you have seen that? Do you have anything to Um, I think uh, I agree with Mary Jean that um, it's more complicated than, oh, you know, half of my family won't read my books in English so that, you know, I'm free to say whatever I want because there's also the question of audience, right? So if I'm writing in English for an English speaking and reading audience, is this audience influencing my choicing, choices? Is it influencing how I write? Uh, so am I really free then in what I'm writing? Do you know? So it's, it's, it's not as, I completely agree with you, it's not as simple as that. Uh, and I feel that maybe it would have been more difficult to say certain things in Arabic than in English. But I think for me, I would have reached that stage anyways, because that's just how I am. I just, it, in the end, I just say, oh, whatever, I'm just going to say what I have to say. In terms of distance, um, I find it interesting that I think, but I might revise that thought later on, but I think that I am more, I am kinder, I am kinder to where I'm from when I write about it in English than then when I'm write to, writing about it in Arabic. Because when I'm writing about it in Arabic, again, the question of audience, right? So I'm writing about that country to people who've lived in it, who know it, who, so I can be crueler to it, if, the, if that makes any sense at all. Whereas in English, I have to be a bit more gentle because I'm bringing it into another language. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, it, yeah. The, and, yeah, I guess that's that's all. Um, and I wonder if the idea of sentimentality is perhaps not something kind of um, very subjective and um, that sometimes is kind of a label put onto writers, quite often women writers, but not, not always, of course. Um, sorry, my my cat. <laughs> um, and so I think when I'm writing, I'll, I will kind of often just be in the first instance when I'm kind of drafting. I'll just be trying to write, you know, for myself and and perhaps for initially you might only have in mind like a friend I might show it to that kind of thing. And so I would try not to put um, pressure on myself. And also I think. I prefer to trust images when I write. So, so I've, I've had feedback before that perhaps there's not, um, when I'm writing prose especially, perhaps there's kind of, I haven't put enough like very clear, um, full emotion explicitly into a piece because I kind of prefer to place images on the page and maybe let the reader um, find their own way into the into the feeling, into the sentiment. So yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, thanks Jenny. I guess you know that that made me re that reminded me of something um, when I was doing my MA um, briefly taught. Uh, by Kai Miller, as some of you will know his work, and I, I really love his, uh, especially his cartographer tries to map 
uh, his way to Zion. But anyway, Kai Muller said something like, oh, if you have to use words like heart and soul, um, those grand words in a poem, you have to earn it. And I, I always remembered that. It's quite interesting, I guess, because I was starting out as a poet and thinking, you know, sometimes you do want to just go quickly to these big words because they, they kind of convey the maximum amount of emotion, but you kind of realize you can't sort of deploy them all the time. You have to use them strategically in a poem. Um, and I think, you know, especially with Zina's work, I really think it just strikes that perfect balance of, you know, you don't shy away from these, these, these big words, but they always earn their keep. And they always, you know, work really well. So yeah, that just reminded me of that, that quote. Um, I don't shy away from these words because I've also learned that A, as women, and B, as writers of color, a lot of white critics tend to immediately assume, ah, oh, she's going to be sentimental, right? And so uh, what, what, is ac what actually ha happens is the opposite. I think what happens to us and women writers of color is that we are so afraid of coming across as sentimental women that we really pay attention to the language or you know whatever, especially when you're first starting off. But I kind of threw all of that out the window right now. And I don't care anymore. Uh, my poetry is lyrical, for sure. Um, and like you said, like the, the words do earn their place, but I no longer shy away from them because it's something taught by white white male workshoppers whatever i've never been in a workshop before by the way i've only done uh, english literature but i am that's how i imagine it to be and so yeah if that makes sense there's a kind of uh, liberation to say no you know what i can use these words and i can use them well and i can write really good poems been reading um Mostly a lot of prose, actually, but there's been such incredible uh, books that have come out this year, especially. Um, and one that had a big impact on me was Don Mi Choi's most recent collection, DMZ Colony. Um, so she's an American poet. And um, the way that she uses visual... Uh, visual poetry, photographs, text, scans and things I find really inspiring and, and really excites me. I think lately I've been like, yeah, my, as I said, I've got such a short kind of attention span and I'm turning towards more like um, visual and text that's, that's really played with um, how it moves on the page and that kind of thing. Um, and there's probably many more that I can't think of at this moment. Oh, I also just finished Antiemetic for Homesickness by Romelin Anti, which is a very beautiful book, which I think speaks to many, many of the things that we've talked about. Um, in terms of books, um, I really love um, Banu Kapil's How to Wash a Heart. Um, again, I think many, many people will have read it. Um, it's, it's a slim volume, but I think it really just really hits home. It's a very subtle sort of message of, you know, even when you're welcomed into someone's home, like what are the terms of that welcome? And, and how can you still feel alienated um, despite, you know, seeming equality in a certain space, in a liberal white space? So I think that's quite a lovely collection. It's just so beautiful. The images themselves are just wonderful. Um, I recently finished uh, Etal Adnan's uh, In the Heart of the Heart of Another Country. And this is a book I've had for years. And I keep like going into it, reading a few pages and then sort of abandoning it for some reason. And I think books somehow f find us back when we need them. And uh, yeah, so these Two, it took me a good two months to finish it, though it's not a very big book, but it's really, you got to read it slowly for its language. And uh, it's like 
poetic, a poetic memoir of sorts. And she moves between Lebanon and the US and France. And she talks about the war, war in Iraq. And she talks about how history impacts our day-to-day -day lives every day. And so I thought uh, it was really good for me to read it right now. Uh, I just finished it. And um, I'm also reading right now Alexander Chi's How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. Uh, also had picked it up, read the first chapter, then abandoned it. Now I've dipped back into it. And for the past few months, again, very slowly, I've been reading Audre Lorde's uh, Sister Outsider. So yeah, these, these have been, this is what I remember so far. <laughs>